Hey everybody, Paul Marlette again with the Physical Education and Wellness Implementation Series on Spatial Awareness. So this is the Yellow Sunglass Series, so you know you're on the right one. Uh, I have decided to actually do videos five and six at the same time because I think they just meld and merge beautifully together. So this time what we're going to be looking at is once your students have some basic manipulative skills, how can we now combine spatial awareness, manipulative skills at the same time, right down to kindergarten, grade one, two, all the way up through, well, eventually through junior high and high school. So in this video, we're going to be looking at some of the games and activities I've already talked about, truck and trailer, Yoshi, uh, the hoop game, and I'm going to give you some ideas on how to use some relays, which is, in my opinion, the unsung hero of physical education. So, as I had mentioned in previous videos, uh, the very next series, Series 5 in the Physical Education and Wellness Implementation videos is going to be completely on manipulative uh, skills, manipulative skills and core movement practices. So, throwing, catching, batting, striking and kicking. So, that's going to be the next series that I tackle here. So this one is not technical with scope and sequencing on the throwing, on the catching, but we're going to be looking at three main ways to manipulate objects and that not each other. Okay, we're not picking up and putting down students or handing off students. This is primarily for objects. So picking up and putting down underrated skill and one that we can start using at a really young age before they can even throw. Next one is the handoff. Again, a really neat skill to start working on because it gets success almost instantly with a couple of quick techniques. The last one is throwing and catching. And again, like I said before, I'm not going to put kids into a situation until I know what they can do. So before you start playing some of these games with a throw and a catch element, please make sure you've gone through that scope and sequence. Yep, there we go. Oh, where to go? There we go. The other thing I do want to draw people's attention to is the same resource that I directed people to in the last video, video four, which was on using dance and gymnastics within your spatial awareness uh, drills and activities from the amazing, the incredible Miss uh, Alicia Olane. This resource here is a phenomenal resource. I'm just going to load it up real quick. Uh, I had the privilege of working with Alicia for many years and one of the things that I love about her stuff is that it is so well put together. So within this, she has created these incredible cards. Now some of them are based on our former curriculum, but they still have all of the, the richness and the elements of movement that we can still be using. And again, here's her gymnastics movement unit. I remember when she was developing this uh, many, many years ago. Uh, so she has given me permission to share this out with everybody. And please feel free to go into the slide deck and you'll be able to access that link there. So let's get right into it. How do we now add the complexity way back to video number one? Isn't it nice how it all comes together? So when we're dealing with adding complexity to games and seeing how students now start to integrate the spatial awareness skills we learned from when they're walking around the gym, going dot to dot, looking for open space, now we add in the complexity and guess what? We need to start from scratch. As soon as we introduce a new concept, we have to expect that the learning curve is going to dip, level off, and then slowly start to climb back up. Where's my camera? Slowly start to climb back up. So if we already have some existing frameworks that we can use, for example, truck and trailer, it's a beautiful way to start to add add complexity because hopefully you've done it enough that they already understand what switch and change mean. So very easy way to start is with some kind of manipulative object. I seem to have put mine down. I will use this dirty cloth. <laughs> 
Okay, so I have my, my manipulative object and it can be anything. I love the rubber chickens, the rubber fish, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I use tennis balls a lot because they're available, bean bags, whatever it is. This time, or even noodles, uh, like a cut up quarter of a noodle, brilliant little baton. So now we can either do two things. We're jogging just like we did in the past. I've got a partner behind me. I say switch. I turn around. Now, who would pass who the object? So what I would do is I would have the leader actually have the object. So when I turn around, I pass it off to the person. They're going to take it and go. Simple handoff, still one of the hardest skills to teach in track and field is to pass something without dropping it. Now the next level of that is could we actually have kids, um, when we say switch, we now want them to be about five, ten feet apart, maybe four feet apart, okay? Further than two arms distance apart. And now they have to toss the ball to each other, toss the bean bag to each other, catch it. Now we can continue to go. You're going to increase the number of reps by saying switch more often. Um, the other thing now is that, remember early on we talked about spatial awareness. How big is my personal space bubble if I'm following someone an arm's distance apart? Not that far. So now what you can do is you can have them estimate. Well, what is a body length? What is two body lengths away? Anyone who's had kids and had to teach them how to ride a bike, that rule of two bike lengths back, not so easy to teach. So now if we're saying let's have two body lengths, you can even have them both lay down head to head, stand up, now they're on their feet, you can see what that distance looked like. So now when they're two body lengths away, that's where we're going to start to pass things back and forth. Simple little thing to add, it's going to take you a while to get kids to be able to do that. What happens if they drop the object? It's up to you to decide. Do a jumping jack, keep going. Run around the object where it lands twice, then keep going. Uh, or just pick it up and go, it doesn't really matter. The other thing this does though, it, it also adds this notion of can you adjust when there's new objects around the space? Balls on the floor can be quite dangerous. So again, something to consider. Remember, pick up, put down. Uh, with my volleyball teams that I was coaching in high school and junior high, we often did things with up and down where they're squatting down, picking something up, moving it, putting it somewhere else. Why? Because it works your whole body. <laughs> The body squat. Oh, we are going to do a, a session on fitness as well. I'm looking forward to that one. But the body squat is a full body workout. So if we can get kids to bend down and stand up 50 times in a class, that's actually a really good workout. So this is one called uppy downy or ups and downs. There's again, lots of variations on this, but basically what it starts with is one cone per student. I love the little disc cones, the little white ones or the green ones with the hole in the center. They're about this tall, literally look like a disc. Beautiful, beautiful thing to have around because you can buy a hundred of them for a pretty good price. Now, what I would do is I would give each, I would put them into two different sides. Okay, the right siders and the upside downers or the tops and the bottom, whatever you want to call it. Okay, the asparagus and the cheese, like who cares? <laughs> make it fun, make it interesting. And one group's job, their only job is to turn the cones that are upside down and to flip them upright and vice versa. The other team, they're trying to take the cones that are upright and flip them uh, upside down. So once you have your designation, each kid has a cone, they can put it anywhere in the gym, which is another interesting thing to see if they remember open space, right? And then you give them a time limit and give them a minute that are going to be exhausted. Give them three minutes and you'll start to see even the older kids start to slow down very quickly. The neat thing about when we add these manipulatives is that we're bridging the gap between spatial awareness and tactical understanding. So right now, what would your strategy be? If you got a team, there's so many different ways to do it. Uh, one strategy is they would pick someone from the other team and just follow them around. So instead of going on the offense, they play more of a defensive game. They let the other team turn it and they try and flip them right away. So that's one technique. Students will come up with their own strategies. Uh, a lot of times I have seen, sometimes teams will wait for the majority of them to be flipped one way and try and do them really quickly. Uh, the other strategy you can add here is that once you pick up a cone, you can move it 10 steps away, five steps away, three steps away. 
whatever it is. And so now what starts to happen is you see the cones start to migrate towards different parts of the room. The key with all of these manipulative skills and the strategy is how you discuss it. Because if we play a game, a one-off like this, and we never debrief it, the students don't lock in any knowledge for next time you would play. So my key framework is always three things. I use it everywhere in my life, but it's what worked, what didn't, what would you do differently? After every camping trip I take with my, my, fam my wife and my kids, we debrief what worked, what didn't, what would we do differently? And I tell you, it doesn't take long before the brain starts to remember those moments when you realize, oh, we forgot this thing. Let's never forget that again. So uppy downy, uh, fantastic thing. Uh, again, manipulation for me isn't just throw and catch. It has to do with pick up, put down. If you're in a badminton unit, another great one, super easy to do, is called, uh, I think it's called trash yard or junkyard, where you throw out all your shuttles and teams on both sides of the nets, and their job is to just throw the shuttles over the net, and at the end of the time, whoever has the most has to do something or not. It could just be your warm-up. Another really easy one. This is called hot potato. I'm going to pull my board up here again. I got a funny little, a bit of a reflection, but I think I can mitigate it. Uh, make this big. There we are. Big. Fantastic. So this is a game called hot potato. Not quite the game, oh, wrong way. Not quite the game that uh, we played where you just toss something to someone and then you toss it to someone else. But what we're going to do is we're uh, going to set up two sides. So we're going to have a line of students on here. Oh, that is a bad reflection. There, that's better. We got a line of students on that side. We got a line of students on this side. And we're going to put a cone in the middle. Okay, so we got this individual over here and we have this line over here. So what's going to happen here is that we have to get the hot potato, whatever the object is, to be handed off before they reach that cone. So it's going to go one and then the other. So this person is going to start running. As soon as they cross center, this person is going to meet them. The person who's handing it off is literally just going to hold it out to the side, right in front of the person who's running. The other person is going to do the classic football. One hand up, one hand down. Okay, palm up, palm down. And you're going to collapse, you're going to collect it. And then before they hit the center on this side, the next person is going to start to run. I have a link in this of a video. Once you see it, it's not too confusing. But what it does is that it sets up a practice, three, four kids, and the, they're always cycling. You just do this over and over and over. Really fun thing to do sometimes is to put in different objects, right? So can you actually do it with a plastic uh, glass or something like that with water in it? So now you have to adjust your speed, all of those kind of things. So that's a super simple game called Hot Potato. But what it does is it sets you up to actually have the ability to do handoffs in your class. That board is really awkward. All right, so I'm going to minimize this down again. It's enough of me being big. So again, when we are doing truck and trailer, uh, we've talked about the potential of handing something or passing something. When we get to that advanced level of truck and trailer, where now we're actually have four people, four or five people in a line, you could actually do a handoff of whatever object it is all the way down the line. So remember, those two, those three or four different ways that we play truck and trailer. The most advanced one is when we have four people, you got one person in the lead. If we say change, that person in the lead is going to run to the back. So if they have the object, they could either hand it back to the first person or it could be the last person who carries the object and they have to pass it forward to the last person before they go. Let me just demonstrate that. Okay, we'll go down to my awesome setup. Right there. Okay, so I've got my four individuals. Where are we there? Right right there okay I got my four individuals okay so Prince Charming is going to be in the lead okay he's my lead runner my 1980s troll has the object okay has the object that we are going to pass forward if we say change the lead what happens is that this person now has to pass that object all the way to the person in the front before they can now run to the back holding the object. 
right? The other thing you could do is that if we're doing the same thing and we want to add a toss to it with this setup is that if we say change, these two people in the middle duck down and now we throw the object from the person in the back to the person in the front. We're going to switch sides and then we keep going. So lots of opportunity to like manipulate these activities so we can add in this level of complexity that just keeps kids on their toes. Okay. Great. Relays. Let's dive into some of these relays. Now relays used to be a huge part of uh, every phys ed class that I was a part of or I was teaching uh, or that I would see my colleagues be running. So the rollicking relay is something that is kind of ever evolving and can be used to assess and evaluate whatever skills you're working with. So these are literally a way to do almost like a check-in. So if you are a core teacher, you teach math, ELA, science, any of those core topics, at the end of the day, we have a, a lot of us use these things called exit slips or entrance slips where we collect a little bit of information from a kid and that gives us those check boxes. Yep, they can do the algebraic reasoning. I just saw them do it on their own. I'm good to go. It's like that check in, right? Something that we can use to establish have we made progress. These can do it all. And it doesn't always have to be just in lines. So there's lots of ways to be creative when we're looking at a relay because it will honestly give students the opportunity to do something that's novel. So we can imp implement all of our movement qualities, the manipulation pieces and locomotion all at the same time. So beanbag partner challenge. Uh, this is an interesting way to do kind of a relay, but it's one that's more set up in more of a circle. So in a gym, we have these opportunities to put different things in different locations. So let's just say I'm going to put uh, four, we'll make this a nice small class. Let's say I've got four, five, six hoops, six hoops around the gym. In the middle, I could put a whole bunch of bean bags or whatever manipulative you want to use. Uh, you could use letter cubes, tennis balls, anything works. And the whole idea here is that let's say I have three students in a hoop at the same time. First person goes, picks up a bean bag, and then returns. Next person goes, picks up a bean bag, does a high five or passes the bean bag off, and the third. So I'm creating a relay, but the relay isn't always going in a linear fashion. You can even color code these bean bags and put them in different hoops. So if I have a red, green, blue, yellow, orange, and teal hoop, and I have corresponding bean bags, I could fill these other hoops with bean bags of all of those colors. And now the same thing occurs. One person goes to another hoop, picks up their colored bean bag, returns. Now my partner goes. So a relay is an opportunity to do uh, activity and then a short rest. Right? And as you go through this, it, let's say now I have to go and get a bean bag, put it in someone else's hoop, then pick up a bean bag from another hoop and return. So right off the bat, there's three iterations that we can do within a couple of minutes and get kids active, but also starting to think, well, why would I go here if I can deposit this one? So they start to think, what is the closest? What is the furthest away? And these are a couple of different setups. Okay, this is the traditional one, and I like this. I still use it. I uh, use this for what we call progressive relays. So I'll just have the first person jog to the end and just wait for their partner. Okay, so a relay or they jog and come back. Something really simple. The next one, they're going to do a jumping jack, then they're going to skip, or then they're going to jog down, jog back. Next thing we're going to do, we're going to add on to it. So now I want them to do a 360 jump. They're going to do their jumping jack, and then they're going to jog there and back, take their partner and go. And we can keep adding things on to that. If we have a ball on the other side, we can have them now do a 360, do a jumping jack, jog to the other side, toss it up and down three times, then jog back, take your partner. This will allow you to kind of increase the complexity as you see, uh, and they get really fun. You can even have kids lay down, roll to the right, roll to the left, and now they actually have to coordinate with each other. 
And anytime you're carrying things, it also increases it. Uh, this one here was a version of the one I just showed where students are moving into the center. I also like it when we have students into the center moving out. If you are a soccer player and you love teaching soccer, this is a great way to kind of watch students in relay format, how their skills progress. Because you can put a series of cones out. So they start in the center, they dribble out, and then they dribble back. Why do I like this? Because now the kids aren't comparing themselves to all the other groups so much because it's not a race. So, so another big thing with relays is that relays don't have to be about the race. Relays can just be how many reps can your group do in a set amount of time. So like everything else in my series, the smaller the groups, the more activity, the more learning is going to be happening. So in relays, I like three. Okay, partners are also fantastic if you have enough uh, equipment. And number two, we're talking about reps versus speed. There's a lot of subtleties within our phys ed classes where if we just do like three people in each line and we say go as fast as you can, what happens is that one team is always going to finish first and those kids know and that last kid, no matter how loud we cheer for him, is probably always going to be the last kid. So can you mix up the order? So the first time we run it, have the number first person go, then the second would lead, then the third person would lead. Uh, I really like doing reps versus speed. So in a minute, how many times can your team get through? Uh, we don't even have to collect how many times. It's those little challenges. Can we build to multiple steps, walk to the end, toss and catch a ball, return, like I was talking with the other uh, uh, relays. And the other thing is that when we're dealing with spatial awareness, uh, sometimes they don't have to be linear. So in this case, we have a central area where all the equipment is. We also have to inform kids that if they're bending down to pick something up and there's other kids running in, we don't want to just bend down with our head. We actually want to bend down like a, like a lunge almost. So we always have awareness of what's around us. That's something in the grade, like kindergarten to grade three, even grade four, I would actually pre-teach. So if you're going in, like in dodgeball, how many times do you have kids hit heads on the center line? Right? That's because when they go down, they look at the ball instead of being aware of their surroundings. So those little things when we add pick up, put down, you'll see kids do stuff. They're like, ooh, that doesn't look safe. And just practice that mobility. Uh, lunges are a great way to do that. It gives you that uh, access as well. In the last video, what, one of the things that I was uh, reviewing is just this notion of uh, the summary documents. The summary documents of the CUSPs, these will help you combine these two skills. So if we look at um, like the bees here, when we're looking, where are we here? Bees, the distraction movements. Let me just find a good one here. Uh, exit similar ways, there is a collaboration, working together, that's the C's. Send, receive while changing directions. So in this one here, this is a grade six. So one of the things that we need to do is to send objects and received objects while we're changing directions. It's a great thing to do in a relay. Okay, how can you set up that relay to allow them to go around a cone and catch, uh, I don't know, a foam ball, a football, a rugby ball, whatever the object is that you're using. Right, so when we're planning for these crossover kind of skills, those kind of documents really make a big difference. Finding space. So we're heading into this notion of uh, tactics. So the key to tactics for me is talking about it. Okay. I often will give students like a minute or two, not very long because I want them active more than I want them uh, chatting with each other. So like you've got a minute to come up with a strategy that you're going to try. If that, tra if that you don't have enough time, I'll give you a little bit more. But with even that beanbag toss or where they're moving around and tossing the beanbags back to their own hoop, what hoop are they going to go to first and why is that? What happens if everyone joins them? Those little conversations after they've tried their tactic, remember what worked, what didn't, what would you do different? Students know way more about this stuff than I ever gave them credit for. And the more I was able to give them the time to do that, the more they kind of jumped into it. Okay? So Yoshi, let's talk about Yoshi because I've, I've kind of set that up. 
This is a game that has lots of tactics, but one of the things when we add some manipulatives is it changes their tactics. So after we play for about three or four days, and honestly, we'll play Yoshi quite a bit at the start of the year because it's great for teamwork, more cusps, right? Sportsmanship, more cusps, link them all together. What I end up doing is that I add a beanbag zone at the back. So in Yoshi, as a quick reminder, by the way, I shot an independent a video just on Yoshi because I had some people want a little more information on it. So in Yoshi, we have a field, pretty simple field, like so, has a line down the middle. Team A is trying to get to that side. Team B is trying to get to this side. So what we end up doing is that in the back of each of the zones, I'll add like six bean bags to start. And what happens now is that if a uh, player B is running across and they get tagged, so they're stranded, one of their players can't free them unless they get all the way to the end and they carry a bean bag and pass that bean bag to the player who is stranded. So now both of these players walk across, that bean bag now gets deposited in A's bean bag storage. So it really does shift up the game. And what it does for the game is that now you have to be conscious of what, how many people get tagged. And sometimes it's beneficial to actually get tagged so you get a bean bag. And again, the, the tactics evolve the more the students play it. The other thing we've tried here is that those bean bags or other manipulatives is that you can toss them. So in our rugby unit, we'll warm up with this. If you toss a ball, then they can carry it across and they're safe and the player can stay behind the line. So lots of different things we can do with that. And when you continually give students this, they start coming up with their own strategies and own modifications of the games, which also shows up within our new cusps. For this next little bit, I'm going to talk about some different ways to actually consciously teach tactics of offense and defense. So I'm just going to switch over to another little modified tabletop here. There we are. Tighten that up. So this is a, a really interesting way to help kids start to figure out uh, the little more advanced levels of what open space is. So these are called, um, what are these called? These are called squares. <laughs> I don't know why I lost that number, that word. So the squares are a way that will let us really pinpoint this whole notion of moving to open space. So these offense and defense squares were, are, are basically designed to shrink the field to maybe 10 feet by 10 feet. Remember, you can modify this, make it smaller, make it bigger. Uh, you're not going to be doing this until about at least grade 3, maybe grade 4, grade 5 for sure. Now, when we start, we're only going to have two people in on that square. Okay? And the only thing they do is they take turns moving to an open square, open cone. Uh, you can also do this with three people. Uh, three people, as you'll see in a moment, gets a little bit challenging because what starts to happen is that they fall into this routine. So with here, if I have three people, this person goes here, this person goes here, this, and you see how they're just going to end up moving around and around and around and around and around. The way you break that, so again, if you're using that deer philosophy from our earlier sessions, the way you break that is by telling them that it's important to go diagonal from time to time and they don't have to go in order. So it's not just follow the leader. This is if I move here, I can turn around and move back and now Batman can go on across. So we just get used to this idea of moving to the open cone. Okay. The next thing we do is that we turn one of them into a defender. And now we've got a little bit of uh, a notion of tag. We make these squares a little bit bigger or smaller depending on the kids. So wherever Batman is, this person has to try and get to that open cone. Okay? And the Batman, the person who's defending, can move wherever they want. Okay? This person can move twice. So if Batman's up there, this person can move over. Now Batman's going to guard here. And you just try and not get tagged. 
If you get tagged, you can high five, do what you want, and then you switch who is the defender in the middle. This starts to develop this really interesting idea that when you're on offense and defense, you have to use your peripheral vision. Because if I see someone moving, well, I'm going to cut them off and try and tag them. The other big thing here is that only one person can move at a time. And I've recommended we start with that deer method. Now, this is like, that's level one, two, and three on that. Because this even gets to be a little more interesting when we add in the discussions on how does it feel to be the person in the middle? What is the best place to stand? What is the, where is the best place to stand? Do you just end up, do the people who are trying to get away just end up running in circles, following each other? Or is there a time when they could actually set up a diagonal run? Did that ever, did that ever show up? The other big thing is that as the offense or defense, does the person in the middle, can you start to anticipate where they're going to go? And again, there's the last question. Does anyone actually cross the square? So this is, this is just like spatial awareness. So we don't have any manipulatives yet. Once we add a manipulative, this is where the whole thing gets a little crazy. Because what you'll see is that if we practice this enough, you now have a language to go back to any of your um, like football, rugby, basketball, um, handball, all of those games that involve the manipulation of an object. We now have a way to break it down again to see what's about to happen. So I'm going to give uh, this individual a, let's do a blue ball. Okay, so again, we can just start this, everyone on offense, and the rule is, is that after you pass, you must move to the open cone. So Batman passes to Garfield, he has to move to the open cone. Garfield passes, he has to move. So after we pass, we move. Again, simple little technique, but when you put this into the context of greater sport, this is the, again, a keynote skill for most of our games. If you watch students play sports in elementary and junior high, even like grade 10, they'll pass a basketball and then they're like, oh, my job is done. I'll just hang out here and wait for someone to pass to me. And the fundamental movement pattern of sport, spatial awareness of sport, is move the ball, move. Get rid of the ball, move. So right away, you start to see how we're actually teaching that, okay? The next thing we do is we put someone on defense, right? And as soon as we do this, what starts to happen is that now you still have to pass the ball and move, but now your options are limited because the person who is playing offense or defense knows that this person is going to have to move at some point. Right? So the thing we set up next is that after you pass the ball, they have to move. But at the same time, if this person can't make the pass, the other individual can also move between the, move between the cones. Okay? So as you get to the more advanced levels, this individual may not have to move right away. Okay? But again, I just wanted to give you like one activity that allows you to dial down into some of the complexities of sport tactics at a young age. Okay? Even if you don't add the defender in there, the whole notion of pass and move, really important one to set up. And for those who, people who are soccer players, a uh, great way to teach a one-two. Okay? If you know what that one-two is, uh, a one-two is that I pass to someone and I move to a different location and they pass to me. So it's two passes between two people back to back. So as we get more advanced, you can now actually put four players in as well. Uh, you can't move with the ball. Defender is trying to intercept the object now, not always trying to tag the individual. So the goal is now not to interfere and touch one of the players, but it's just to get the ball. It's kind of like advanced pig in the middle. Not pig in the middle, that's not a good one. Uh, individual in the middle <laughs> okay uh, when we're doing that there's lots of micro teaching so if we see something that the kids aren't doing or they're not moving to an open cone you stop them micro teach it 
This is what I want you to try differently. Size of the box and the type of object is going to change the game completely. You can also have like a 20 second switch uh, or a number of interceptions. So if one student is doing really well, they have to intercept the ball four times. Or you can just say person who's defending, you're in for 30 seconds. When I say switch, next person's gonna come in and try it. So the tactical side, again, there's a summary sheet here for when you're doing your planning. So feel free to click that through that. Uh, assessing group progress for the next progression. Okay. This, this to me, when you're dealing with all of this stuff, if you haven't seen the other sessions, we've tried to set them up sequentially. The key here is to actually put your back against a wall and just observe. So as teachers, we often want to jump in and give lots of feedback. Sometimes the best thing to do is to satellite it. So step back, watch what you're seeing. If you're seeing kids walk between cones, give them a challenge. You got two seconds, one second to get between those cones, right? I want that pass to be below the head so you can't throw it over the defender. When you see those keys about how they're moving and how they're throwing and the choices they're making, with tactics, that's the key to allow them to move forward. Right? Remember, one or two things, that's all you need to change. I talked about this in the last video, but I am going to go through it quickly one more time. How do you track student progress? So the piece that I put together for people is based on my own teaching. Uh, it looks like this. This is all of the cusps for grade three. So these are the S and P's, the skills and procedures. If you pair that with a tool that looks like this, now I'm able to evaluate certain cusps every week or every day, every month. Maybe I'm going to pick four I'm going to do each month and review it. Something efficient so at the end of the year you can look back I have, in elementary, I only have two indicators on our report card currently where I teach. So I have to, I have to summarize, what is this, almost, 20, when did, yeah, almost 22 different outcomes into two report card stems. So I love this system because it allows me to get a quick snapshot of the students without taking too much time. That's that. Uh, yeah, so and I, I'm, the next series is our fifth series in the se uh, sequence, and it is all on manipulatives, uh, kick, throw, bat, catch, and it's going to be very much based around practical assessment, practical evaluation, and techniques to help students progress through those stages. Okay. Thank you so much. That is the end of the Spatial Awareness mini-series. If you need support, please send me a message. And other than that, we will see you on the next series, probably with a different color of sunglasses. Thank you so much, everybody. And I hope you got something out of this series and you have something to implement as you move forward into your daily classes.